You're listening to episode 42, Mora's Story, A Son with Down Syndrome. Hi, and welcome to the Child Life On Call podcast. When your child is sick, the whole world seems to stop in its tracks. Plans and priorities change, and your number one job becomes figuring out how to get your child well again. For some of us, rest, medications, and relaxation can do the trick. But for others, it takes more. It takes countless doctor appointments, invasive medical testing, therapy, surgeries, the list goes on, and then you still may not have all the answers or results you were hoping for. This podcast features parents of children that have an illness or medical condition and gives them a place to share their own journeys and experiences. We will talk about the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, but one thing seems to remain the same. Children are resilient and teach us more about ourselves and the world than we could ever imagine. Thank you so much for lending a listening ear and opening up your heart to these families and this podcast. I'm your host, Katie Taylor. Anything is possible and the higher the bar you set, they will reach it. Yes, it's going to take some thinking outside the box, but once you kind of zoom out and realize there's a lot of people out there with incredible ideas and there are no limits on what they can do. Hello, everyone. I am so glad that you are here today to listen to Maura's story. Oh, so I was chatting with her um, after we connected and I was like, I don't know how I'm going to make it through this episode without crying because Ryan is the stinking sweetest thing in the whole world. And so I just can't wait for you to hear the woman who created this amazing boy, uh, Maura, and get to hear more from her. I know you're going to know what I'm going to say before I say it. (laughs) So let me just get it out of the way. Please subscribe and follow along on Instagram and Facebook, Child Life on Call. And please rate and review this podcast if you haven't already. So it makes it easier for other friends and family to be able to find us and hear connections and other stories. So without further ado, I'm glad you're here today. And let's listen to Maura. Yeah, so my name's Maura Seneff, and um, my husband Jack and I have three little kids. Uh, well, I guess they're not so little anymore. JP is 10, <laughs> Ryan is 8, and Catherine is 5. And we live in St. Louis, and uh, that's where I grew up. And Ryan has Down syndrome, and really has the first six years of his life had just a lot of chronic illness issues that people kind of just lump into down syndrome. But I felt like, okay, what if we like zoom out and treat him like any other kid? How would we treat this, you know, each of these issues? And it was a long, long, long list, but, um, anyway, so he's doing amazing now. He's eight years old and going into second grade and He's in a gen ed private school, um, pretty near grade level at every, in every subject. Um, he's riding a bike without training wheels. He learned that at age six, he's skiing in the trees in Colorado, uh, Beaver Creek this past winter, he went in the trees and he was skiing at three, uh, potty trained at three, walking at a year and a half, um, and that's not like, ooh, look at Ryan. Because there are so many kids with Down syndrome that are doing way more than that. And mm-hmm. so it's not a competition, but it's kind of more about where he came from and that rough uh, first six years of life just, you know, we can go into all that. But um, yeah. so it's kind of like a turnaround story and just a message of hope um, because really anything can be improved or worked on. And, um, so I think that's kind of how we got him where he is just never giving up and kept, yeah, that's, kept searching. He's like, Hey, any kind of obstacles, not an obstacle to me. I'm going <laughs> to plow it down and make it work. Yeah. I mean, so for us, you know, when you receive a diagnosis of any kind, it puts you in a box with limits. I'm sure you hear that all the time. And, um, 
my husband and I decided like day one that I think we just visualized um, that Ryan was not going to let the Down syndrome diagnosis define him. And I'm Mm -hmm. sure many families say that and feel that and embody that. Um, And for us, we just didn't want it to define him. And I just like, don't even remember if I said it out loud, but I was like, he's going to defy it. And so Mm. um, it wasn't just about Ryan and me being delusional or stubborn (laughs) uh, or in denial because you sure go through a lot of grief and mourning of what you thought you had upon one of those diagnoses. But for me, it was about kind of unlocking his potential so that we could help the next generation. Wow. Well, you're certainly doing that. And so is, so is Ryan. I love how vocal you guys are and, um, the videos that you share and, and all that you've done. But, um, will you take us back to kind of the beginning? Because, you know, you and I have talked before, um, through email that this was a, this was a diagnosis that you weren't expecting when he was born. Um, can you kind of walk us through like your pregnancy and the birth and, and all of that, the, the NICU stay at the beginning? Sure. And then realizing I forgot to bring Kleenex over here. Um, <laughs> Same. And, uh, <laughs> We're in trouble. Yeah. So he, we did not have any prenatal testing. He was born in 2012. So that was that um, 10 week test wasn't, um, prominent then, or I can't remember Mm -hmm. if it was out then, but anyway, it wasn't a thing. And, um, I did watch my brother and sister-in-law go through a false positive, um, Mm -hmm. with their first pregnancy. And, um, my husband and I decided then, and that was before we were, had our first child that we would not get any prenatal testing because, so I guess there must have been some kind of test because <laughs> yeah. she did something. I don't remember which exact test. Right. But anyway, um, I think we watched them have a pretty great pregnancy and it was a false positive. And even it, even though they had learned that it, he did not, their son did not have Down syndrome, like still on the day of his birth, my brother would like look at the doctor and was like, so are we good? You know, mm-hmm. and, um, so we just decided like all that's going to cause is anxiety and what's the point and whatever. So we never did any, any prenatal testing with our first two pregnancies Mm -hmm. and our oldest was a healthy baby boy and, you know, latched right on. So I kind of knew what to expect on the second Mm -hmm. birth. Like, you know, like, you know, what, what happens when they hand you the baby. And so, uh, I didn't have any markers on any ultrasounds. Um, I did have like a late ultrasound, like, I can't even remember why it was like 35 weeks or something. I don't know if I had like a, I don't remember, honestly, I swear I blocked it out, Mm -hmm. but I remember the tech leaving the room for a while and coming back and I had like some gut feeling of like, what's the problem? What's the problem? Mm -hmm. And no one ever said anything. And, you know, I've never gone back, like, because it wasn't ordered for any prenatal markers I, you know, I have no idea if she saw anything or if she just left the room to see if whatever, you know, how you just get this like, Oh, totally. So on the day he was born, he was a couple weeks early, Ryan, my husband travels a lot. He's in finance. And I remember we didn't even have the car seat in the car, you know, the second kid, you just kind of were like, uh, and uh, I did have Braxton Hicks all day. I was at some alumni luncheon at my high school and I kept asking my best friend, like, gosh, did you have Braxton Hicks? And everyone kept like, oh yeah, I Braxton Hicks. Mm-hmm. So I didn't realize how high my pain tolerance was. We get to the hospital, I'm like seven centimeters <gasps> and I could barely breathe through the contractions to get the answers out about, you know, what's your date of birth and insurance and all this. And I'm like, can't you ask my husband? Like I'm in a bad way. Here. <laughs> if I you know. Get the epidural. I'll be super nice. And, um, so they finally, you know, get through it. And I was like, Oh, thank God. Now I'm just going to take a nap. Cause I was so exhausted. And my doctor finally walked in and was like, yeah, you sneeze and this baby's coming out. So <laughs> get prepared. Really quickly he came <laughs> and, 
um, they brought him over to check him out and all that stuff. And um, there was a little bit more time over there than normal. And I remember they, you know, I was out of it, but they called a pediatrician in. And I don't think I realized that they had called a pediatrician at the time. But looking back, someone told me or something. And yeah. So then they handed him to me, and now now it's when I'm wishing I had the Kleenex. And he wouldn't latch on and had, like, no suck reflex. And um, so immediately I knew, like, something was off because he had just, like, no – he wasn't really crying and, like, no fire, you know, that these newborns have. So, um, you know, you can't help but compare that to your first newborn – like you just that's all you know for reference and um so for some reason like everyone left the room so I'm looking back I think it was like to give us a moment to bond and before all the shock and whirlwind and all that stuff um happened um so we were there for a while and I kept trying to get him to nurse and it was ticking me off that he wouldn't latch on and he didn't really have a Like I said, like, why doesn't he have a desire to eat? He's not hungry. Like, this is not okay. Um, But he didn't look, you know, sickly. They had mentioned something about his breathing, but it obviously wasn't that acute because they let me hold him for a while. Mm, Um, Yeah. And I looked at my husband, Jack, and said, he looks like he has Down syndrome. And he was like, and I think the reason I'm, I can't believe I'm like on a podcast crying, but I think the reason (laughs) I'm crying is that, you it's not that I'm sad now it's that I can't believe how sad I was and I didn't know anything and I didn't like parents don't know what they don't know and you know now I I think of that day and I I'm I'm like you know that wasn't a great day (laughs) in -hmm. terms of the shock but I, I'm sad about um, all the emotions that we went through and parents have to go through to get to the other side to realize the endless joy and mm. um, powerful lessons and just victories and you know now how much joy Ryan brings us. Um, it makes me like kind of crazy to think about all that sadness that goes into Mm. the initial shock. Um, and I wouldn't want to like relive those early days of trying to, you know, your head spinning and you're trying to figure out what the right formula is and all this stuff. So, um, well, anyway, you're definitely so not, you're not alone. I've had so many parents on this podcast say, I wish I could go back and tell myself, guess where we end up, like, guess where we get to. And, you know, it's also, I hear that you really don't have the experience of these intense joys until you have felt some of that, that pain and that sorrow and the unknown. It's just, it gives me chill bumps just thinking about the, the different level of emotion that you go through. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so our pediatrician, you know, they did take Ryan to the NICU and um, they just kind of said, oh, we're just going to check some things. And I think I I didn't even go in there because I think I knew I had to, like, get my own head in order. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which that makes sense. Horrible. But I don't think they wanted me in there at first. You know, they were running tests and all this stuff and they wanted the, our pediatrician to deliver the news and they had to wait on this blood test. And anyway, so our, my husband had been out in the hall, our friends and my mom came to visit and, um, they all went in there and, uh, my husband was out in the hall and he saw our pediatrician. It was a Saturday night and he walked in, in his like work clothes from being out in the yard and he knew, Hmm immediately like yeah. that's not normal the pediatrician doesn't just roll in on a Saturday yeah and yeah. um so he sat down on our my bed and my husband Jack was in the chair next to me and 
the doctor um, held my hand and said, I don't know why I'm crying. He said, I'm pretty sure Ryan has Down syndrome. And um, I just blocked out everything else he was saying. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. really remember. I remember mm -hmm. he started talking about the heart and looking for a hole in the heart and all this stuff. But I literally blocked it out. And I looked at Jack. And I knew when I saw Jack's hand, head in his hands that I would have to lead this mission. Not that he couldn't handle it, but he works 90 hours a week and travels. <laughs> and my rock that I always lean on was just, I just knew in that instant, like he's just as clueless on this one as I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he doesn't have the bandwidth to do all the research. And um, yeah. he certainly has been supportive and um, in the early days went to, you know, tons of doctor appointments, um, you know, if they were talking about surgery or something, but, but I just kind of knew like, Oh boy, this is, this one's on me. And, yeah. um, uh, and so yeah, the heart was fine. You know, like I said, a lot of kids overcome much bigger health obstacles than mine. Um, like a 50% are born with a hole in their heart. Um, and you know, just, you never know how the extra chromosome is going to affect the systems in the body. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not a one size fits all thing. It's like, just can be any number of health issues. So there are certainly a list of like some that are more common and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. in general, he was pretty healthy and um, was on a breathing, you know, to, I don't remember if he was on a two. He was on a vent. I don't know what he was on. Some, maybe just <laughs> nasal. <laughs> I blocked it out. Do you know what though? <laughs> like it's, it's, it's good to hear you say that because you know, when you're in it, it's like you're living minute to minute. It's like, you yeah. know, the amount of milliliters they just had and how much they puked. So it's like, it's a little bit of a relief to hear you say you don't remember yeah. because when you're in it, it is all encompassing. Yeah. So, you know, like there becomes a point where it just becomes, oh, it was a breathing tube and it was still serious. And I remember f the details yeah. of it, but you know, it, it takes a little bit of pressure off. Like this yeah. day to day is going to go away at some point. Yes. Yes. And the thing that the pediatrician said to us that I'll never forget. And I say this to new families of any, and it really adults, kids, any diagnosis is, you have to mourn the loss of what you thought you had. And that is a critical piece, like you said. And um, a lot of doctors were like, well, do you want a Xanax or an Ambien or this or that? And I was like, I don't judge people who take that by any means. People need that. But for me, I just felt like I needed, I didn't have experience with taking those kind of things. And I didn't feel like it was a good time to try and I yeah. felt like I needed to feel the feels like feel sure. all the emotions to get to the other side and I you know for me I didn't want to be numb not just because I knew there would be a million decisions to make but be also because I just felt like I needed to feel every emotion at that moment, even though it was not an enjoyable time <laughs> right. to feel those, um, and that stress and a lot of it was just the overwhelming unknown, like you said. Um, right. but I think to get to the other side and be stronger for myself personally, um, you know, we had to get over that. And I think I spent like the beginning few months just with people saying dumb things to me. <laughs> and so I oh, like, yes. spun up and ticked off all the time with those kind of things. But it was nothing I wouldn't have said to someone else because I did not know what Down syndrome was. Neither did my husband. Yeah. I mean, we had like an idea, but sure, we really weren't exposed to many people with special needs because we both went to private school our whole lives. And um, but what I did know and like, you know, a nurse came in and told me about her sister and, you know, people shared stories. I, what I did know was immediately it, we had to improve the trajectory and the outcomes and 
the story and what's possible for the next generation. And that's true probably of any diagnosis, I would guess parents feel that way. Um, I didn't have a background in education or, you know, um, anything having to do with physical therapy or anything like yeah. that. I was I yeah. worked in medical device sales and pharmaceutical sales. So I knew a little bit about Western medicine, but I wasn't, um, I was not an expert in any way on any kind of teaching or anything, but I knew logically that anything could be worked on or improved and, yeah. uh, whether it was health outcomes or, um, cognitive outcomes. So I did, you know, our older son, we read to him a lot and read to Ryan a lot. And I just kind of like day one was like, we're going to get this kid going. <laughs> yeah. So we did do that and it worked well in some ways um, with, he was actually reading before he learned to talk and we didn't realize it until he learned to talk. Wow. Um, he, uh, so I didn't know if he would talk. Some kids with Down syndrome or autism or others, you know, don't talk. And right. um, so I didn't know if he was going to talk. We obviously had all the interventional intervention therapists. And my idea was, all right, we're just going to like triple the amount of therapy and that'll work. We'll yeah. get him going that way, like on this one path. And um, it worked in some ways, like he met milestones not as late as he would have had we not done that but mm -hmm. it wasn't it was like his health it, we couldn't keep the balls all moving in forward because his health was constantly getting in the way so he had chronic constipation so he only pooped like every couple weeks and so that was like a thorn in my side for sure mm. And no one really wanted to say it, but they were, you know, finally some, I flew them around the country and people were kind of like, probably going to be on a diaper or a daily suppository for the rest of his life. And wow. that's um, a lot to hear. So people, you know, they waited to say it. It took me like really asking some questions. I'm like, what's the deal? Why haven't we fixed this? Um, and, uh, but more acute issues were just constant infections like ear infections respiratory infections in the hospital a couple times with RSV and pneumonia um and as late as 2017 he was I think five was in the ICU with mycoplasma pneumonia and wow. um and that's when I vowed like all right we are never coming back here <laughs> yeah and um so had to you know, turn over a lot of rocks along the way to, um, just get out of that constant feeling of like we were drowning in acute illness. Yeah. And so when you guys were hospitalized for any, whether it was an infection or whatever, how, how did you communicate to the medical team what worked? Cause it's like, you're always an advocate as a mother, right? But then when you go into a situation and you're depending on people to take care of him who don't know him like you do, how did you translate that to the medical team? So, um, I knew, I didn't know a lot about ICU medicine. I'd been in the ICU with some, you know, medical devices. I'd been in there, um, but it's not like I could treat my son. <laughs> yeah. But, um, uh, yeah. I knew also enough about research. Um, Down syndrome actually had no research for 20 years in Congress uh, until like two years ago. No NIH research because the answer in Congress was te early prenatal testing for abortion. Mm. And wow. I actually wouldn't let myself go there <laughs> mentally. But right. I knew... Um, again, if we just zoom out and look at him like a little boy, instead of like this boy with down syndrome who has all these right. health issues that, you know, we can't fix. Um, one of the earliest that things we learned when he was like two weeks old, they do a CBC blood draw on every kid with down syndrome at least once a year, because they often have a low white blood count. 
and just counts all over the place. And leukemia is more common with kids with Down syndrome. So I think they just monitor that. And Ryan had a lot of a very low white blood count at birth, which is what fights infection. And um, Ryan had a lot of blood draws emergently um, mm. with different petechia rashes and things that can appear with either as a present in leukemia or a staph infection or, 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 and I'll never forget the first, well, when they first told me he had a low white blood count, um, I was like, so what do we do to fix that? (laughs) And they were like, so they just, sometimes they just walk around like that. And I was like, they, are they like a different species or, and it wasn't that, I guess it just, I just had this no limits mentality from day one that um, people didn't, weren't used to, I think, Mm -hmm. Um, both in the medical community and the, um, you know, education world. And I had called, you know, tons of people I knew with kids with Down syndrome and You know, they might have had other challenges, but they didn't have this low white blood count and chronic constipation. And um, we ended up getting, because of all these infections and um, GI issues, we ended up down this track of like a lot of functional medicine doctors. And so it seemed like, okay, we have all these lists of labs with horrific, um, every lab is in a horrible range scary (laughs) that almost like why did I even do that but then at least I felt like okay well we can fix that how do we fix that you know right (laughs) gives you like a yeah but right um, then we tried all these things and nothing worked and you know you try and nothing like I wasn't just googling stuff we had like MDs I was flying in (laughs) Um, I had him I had him potty trained at age three behaviorally by an ABA behavioral therapist in New York City and she really was a pivotal force. Um, she was a BCBA, and that is like a therapist for people with people think it's only for autism, right? But again, mm-hmm. when I zoomed out and I was like, well, the brain is a brain, <laughs> right? How about we just apply that therapy to Ryan and anyone can learn anything, right? I mean, think about it. We use it, that therapy essentially for animals, like whether it's sea lions at the zoo or it's dogs true. or horses, it's behavioral therapy. It's like a reward based system and, or uh, therapy. And my husband and I had tried to get him potty trained on our own using the same method as our older son, you know, three day potty training. And we made enough progress to know he could do it on our own, but we weren't using the right currency. We kept trying to give him matchbox cars and stuff but like he's looking at us like i already have a thousand matchbox cars because he gave those to jp when he was <laughs> you know oh my gosh so yeah like, mm. so nah. when we flew to new york this woman had him on the morning of day two leaving a preferred activity coloring so like not math problems Right. Walking in on his own to go in independently indicating he had to go to the bathroom. Wow. And he was verbal, but not that verbal. Um, maybe he could say potty, but I don't even know if he was doing that at the time. Um, yeah. And, but what that showed me was, or reinforced to me was like, I'm not crazy. He can learn anything. You know, we had yeah. done the the infants rescue swimming at 14 months and same thing. I made him walk all the way in the pool from the parking lot with his little nimbo walker and he could swim and roll over and float in the water before he could walk without that walker. And so it was just like finding those people out there who were willing to get in the trenches with you essentially and, and give him a shot, you know? Yeah. And, um, he, the early intervention therapist that came to our house, like three to four days a week each, you know, his PT, OT and speech therapist. I mean, they are like part of the family. They were certainly in the trenches with us, but, and it works well for a lot of kids, but Ryan and a lot of kids with Down syndrome need more. And so Mm -hmm. it was like a matter of, 
um, constantly trying to triage the acute illness and then keep the, uh, yeah. like skills moving forward. And there was definitely a lot of regression. And so it was just kind of this whirlwind the first six years until we've kind of found the right fit for him. Yeah. I have so many questions in my mind. Um, <laughs> One of them is about, you mentioned when people say the wrong thing to you and I'm sure it just, it comes with practice and patience and self-reflection like anything else. But, um, for a parent who is just starting out, um, with a baby with Down syndrome or another chronic illness of some kind and people say the wrong things, how did you process that stuff? How did you respond? Like, how did, how did you deal with that? Um, so I've had people reach out to me, like just randomly from other states on my Instagram, uh, who are like, wow, your page shows so much hope. And it's not that Ryan is doing more than other people. He's not like, we have friends who have overcome incredible odds, like, um, a little guy who was like 12 or 13 or 11 or 12, who is nonverbal and he's no longer nonverbal. He's talking now. And uh, another little guy who is in Kansas City who's Ryan's age, and he's, like, skiing way better than Ryan. His mom's a PT, and I'm like, you don't realize how lucky you are you're a PT. Um, <laughs> but he's killing it. And um, so for Ryan, even me in the NICU, I remember calling them Downs kids. And I would be like, well, do Downs kids do this? Do Downs kids do that to the neonatologist? Mm. Can they do this? And and I remember hearing her say, yeah, kids with Down syndrome. And, and like now it does kind of like irk me a little bit when people call him like a Downs kid or... And it's not that they mean to, like, I did it. I didn't know. Mm. It's more just about, you know, it's not a PC thing. It's like just kind of like a way that um, I always say Ryan has Down syndrome. And somebody from the Down syndrome Association of St. Louis actually told me this and gave me a little pamphlet on, like, the language to use and stuff. Yeah. And it's, um Again, it's not like a PC thing, I don't think. I think it's just more about, again, not letting that define who he is. Sure, he's a child first. Yeah, foremost. he's Ryan and he happens to have Down syndrome. You know? Right, exactly. And, um, I think that having that mentality has helped us um, continue to ensure that he does not let that define him. Because mm -hmm. I think it's easy to get into this self-fulfilling prophecy as a parent or as a society or educators or physicians or whatever as um, putting kids in a box or anyone in a box with limits mm -hmm. with that diagnosis. Yeah. And like that's really all the story we heard that was limits. And right. um, that's what I was not willing to, I couldn't get on that train. And so I tell new families, um, you know, it's not going to be easy. You're going to have to turn over a lot of rocks, but I can help you show you what worked for us. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of things out there that'll work. Or, but the biggest thing is you wake up every day and you tell yourself there are no limits. And you tell your little one, no limits. And just those high expectations, like behaviorally, he has the same expectations as our other kids. And really, he actually has higher expectations because people have low expectations of him. And he knows that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, you know, when he was really little, he like wore a collared shirt 100% of the time. Because people at the grocery store would treat him better if he was like prepped out in preppy wow. clothes and oh. um anywhere and so you know whereas my other son wore like you know superman t-shirts and whatever when he was i mean he wore preppy clothes too but but even to preschool yeah. i don't think he ever wore a t-shirt and oh my now gosh. my my 10 year old jp is like mom he needs to look like a normal dude he needs to wear like an under armor <laughs> shirt or whatever you know so now he's like you know especially in COVID, you know, 
quarantine, our other son's not going to school in his collared shirt. So yeah, exactly. They're both, but he wants to wear whatever JP wears to bed. And that happens to be shorts and a t-shirt now. So that's what he's wearing. But his behavior has to be pretty dang near perfect. And even his head of school called me in and right before COVID January, February and said, Maura, I just, he's in a typical gen ed school. And he has some private therapists that go in and she said, I just don't think he needs all these therapists. Like he's just doing amazing. Like, why do you have all these? And I was like, I, I get it. And so it's like a train the trainer kind of model where they'll kind of train the, all of his teachers. And this year where there were more specialist teachers, like the science teacher and stuff. Mm Mm-hmm on his behavior plan, which is very simple. It's just, you know, he has to do things himself and he has to ask for help. And, you know, so there are all these like language um, challenges he had to where he couldn't ask for help. So that's where like 90 something percent of behaviors pop in for kids, any kid, but particularly a kid with special needs who has a language delay is if they don't know how to ask their peers to play or ask their peers, Hey, give me, can I have that ball back? Or where's the bathroom? Or can you help me with this worksheet? Or, um, they don't have the executive functioning skills. So anyway, to answer your question about the, what do we say early in the early days, you just have to not let it get to you. And I wasn't always good about that, but, I think if I had to do anything all over again, it would be to, uh, I wish I would have meditated, um, Mm. day one. And, um, someone brought me a little reading when he was in the hospital about living in day tight compartments. And it just said, you can't control, you know, we kept thinking about where, where's he going to live when he's 45 and is he going to live with (laughs) us? And What's he, I mean, all these thoughts yeah. that come in your mind about like, is he going to be verbal? Is he this? Is he that? Is he going to, I don't know. Like you just, all the dark thoughts come in your mind right. and thoughts about like, well, why is, I don't know. Um, so, uh, meditation, I am not a crunchy person, but people told me to do this for years. He has like a few doctors who are not from the U S and then another P a couple PhDs from other countries and an MD who's from India. And then one of his therapists, PhD therapists lived all over the world. And I thought it is ironic that they are all avid meditators and they have all been telling me <laughs> to start meditating. And I never did it. And then like 2019, I was like, Jack, we're going to meditate every day. And then I never still didn't do it. I did it like nine times. And then one day halfway through the year, I was like, no, for real, we're going to meditate. And he's like, Maura, I have been. I I was like, what? He's like, yeah, I just play the Peloton app when I'm traveling and I can't sleep. So it just helps you not get wrapped in all those overwhelming thoughts. And uh, just you still have those thoughts and you need to have those thoughts. But it just kind of helps you like watch them pass by instead of getting stressed out. And then once I started meditating, I realized, Oh wow. My heart was like racing a lot. So that's not actually normal. And, um, it just helps you sleep better. You can just turn on the app and you're in a coma instantly. And that is critical for any parent on the planet, but especially one who's dealing with, you know, a chronic illness and, or like a billion things trying to figure out you know I like that all these developmental like, mind stuff. it's like the meditation is it's great because you can take it with you anywhere it's really yes. inexpensive and it's a <laughs> yes it's a it's a tool that can work regardless of the situation you're in so like if you're in a grocery store and you're stressed it's not that you can sit there and on the floor and meditate but yeah you can reach back to your meditative state and where you were and calm yourself to get close to there. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, Just take a deep breath. Yeah. And you know, people yeah. can say that to us until they're blue in the face, but I love that you're mentioning meditation because it is incredibly powerful for kids too. 
you know, our kids, it's funny you say that, have started doing it with us. Mm -hmm. And again, we do not sit in the middle of the floor. We don't have a meditation room. We're not like on pillows at noon with, you know, sitting cross-legged. It's like 10 minutes in the morning before you get out of bed on your little app and 10 minutes at night. And, you know, a lot of times I don't do it in the morning, but I should. But when your three kids are all talking to you at the same time and in the back of your <laughs> mind is not only the list of the, you know, doctors you need to call after you make all these lunches and this and that. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's hard. I was snapping at my kids a lot and it, yeah. it is really helped with that and being more patient. And my kids now ask to do it before bed, especially wow. the younger two. And Catherine, our youngest went through a crying phase and, you know, I think they all do, but she was like five when she was going through this and it wasn't at school. It was just at home, like these tantrums. And we started doing it with her and it helped a ton. Just wow. not like, hey, tantrum equals meditation. We would just do it proactively before bed, and it just helped her stay in bed and stay calm. And just, it's I I kind of tell them it's a life skill. It's like a tool in their toolbox that none of mm -hmm. us got when we were growing up in the '80s, yep. or at least I was. Yeah, exactly. And so this is another tool. And my oldest actually. Um, he doesn't do it as often, but I did turn on the call map and he thought it was cool that LeBron James, the basketball player had a whole series and it was about, that's cool. um, you know, like people think that my jump shot or my workout or my nutrition or this or that is like the key to my success. He's like, honestly, it's about calming the mind and you'll, and he wow. talks through about different games and, you know, some tied game with a minute left, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah. they called a timeout and you'll see me on the TV, like sitting there with my head, just getting in the zone. And wow. so um, an adolescent can for sure <laughs> relate to that. Right. If you see one of yeah. your idols doing it in that kind of a situation. Yeah. So I don't know. I just think it has helped me manage stress and also honestly, like think more cl clearly and, um, yeah. and problem solve much better than, when mm -hmm. I always say at the beginning, my head is spinning, my head was spinning. And so that's the other thing I tell new families and new parents, because, you know, they're like, so sad. And they're like, is this normal? And I can't think and one mom's like, I've had a, I've been having these panic attacks. And, and I'm like, that is normal. It is normal. And, right. it is, you know, I can't say I had a panic attack. But I can tell you that that stress and that feeling of your head spinning I have been there and it is not fun and you do not need to stay there. The number one thing is to start meditating because you have to be able to breathe and think about triaging 19 things right. at once. Right. <laughs> That's a good way and to put it for sure. So I don't know. And then also yeah. just, I don't know, I read some book about it and it was saying how moms of kids with chronic illness show stress on their brain. So I think that was honestly mm. what made me really kind of like, okay, we're going to do this. <laughs> right. Exactly. I know what my MRI looks like right now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so anyway. So, um, so you mentioned the, um, so you like the Calm app. Um, and then you mentioned there was a, and Headspace. And then you mentioned mm -hmm. the St. Louis, um, is it the Down Syndrome Association and what other resources, um, really have helped you guys throughout his eight years? Um, so he's found, he, you know, St. Louis Children's Hospital has been huge. Um, a lot of his specialists are like family there. Um, especially when we were like living there, triaging all these acute illnesses all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, but we've also found some, uh, so when we did that potty training weekend in New York, I realized that ABA behavioral therapy is the key to life. And so anyone listening to this who has a, any child with a genetic abnormality or even just like a health diagnosis that mm -hmm. requires them to relearn some skills or keep their skills up, can use uh, behavioral therapy in terms of 
um, retraining the brain. And so I think that's the biggest message that um, I also tell new families is the brain is not fixed. And so it is malleable and it molds with experience. So the more you put in and use it like a muscle, the better the long-term out- outcomes with any human right. on the planet. So yes. people think this ABA is only for kids with autism, but again, it can be used for like any human. I could use it. I'm always late. I sh- could use a little plan. Um, <laughs> but um, for kids with a severe language delay, of course, speech therapy is part of the early model that works, right? Early right. intervention model. But I think that um, applying that applied verbal analysis subspecialty of uh, ABA is critical um, intense language acquisition that will close the gap on a lot of those language delays that A, cause behavioral issues or B, um, just the, the kids can't communicate their needs so people don't think that they understand or and if you think about it like an IQ test what is that any um, immigrant you know you would have like a neuroscientist or something but if English is not their first language and they're not great at English but they're brilliant they're gonna bomb an IQ test Mm mm-hmm yeah so so with Ryan like who cares about like an IQ test. But my point is it's all about like, how do we get him to communicate what's inside? Right. And also communicate, you know, like for example, on a reading comprehension test, sometimes he could answer the correct multiple choice question, but he couldn't verbalize the right answer. Right. Mm -hmm. So our goal is not to have him have accommodations his whole life with multiple choice questions. It's to close the gap on that language deficiency. Okay. So for us, the applied verbal analysis um, subspecialty of ABA has been critical. And mm-hmm. I think also if there was another thing I was to start at the beginning that we didn't start till he was like five or six is um, um, starting with that ABA therapy at birth for any kid with a disability is critical because it trains them on all those executive functioning skills that are often the reason they don't always, uh, people don't see their potential as they get put in preschool and then passed on to early at, or uh, elementary school. So mm-hmm. if at birth they're meeting their miles quickly or quicker because an ABA therapist is helping the PT and OT measure every rep not just every day the data but every rep and then if that's if they're plateauing they go back and like modify the task to break down the skill to make it easier to master that skill to then get to the next step if that makes sense of whatever Mm -hmm. the skill is that they're learning um then by preschool when they're learning how to put their lunchbox in their backpack and hang it up on the hook you know these like couple of step directions they have a they can do it along their peers but I think what happens is with just PTOT and speech they are working on those of course he had therapists working on all those multi-step directions this whole six years until we started ABA but he needed more you know I Mm -hmm. think they would all agree that it, it was like he was progressing but once we added in that step, it's what was critical. So if I had to do it all over again, that is the fastest um, piece to add to the team of all the therapists. Mm-hmm. And then I just randomly broke my foot. Um, I don't know if that was oh, the no. next question you were going to ask. <laughs> yeah. I, like, how are your feet? <laughs> my feet are fine. But this was a couple of years ago. I randomly broke my foot. Uh really badly. And I was told my doctor I was above nothing and I would do anything to get this, to heal this thing because I had three little kids that needed me like in the pool. Yeah. You know, they could swim independently, but I couldn't like sit on the lawn chair. And right. uh, 
So I found myself in a, my medical doctor sent me to a PhD Chinese medicine doctor from China. And that has been for us the other pivotal piece of the puzzle to really turn around Ryan's health, uh, to go from triaging one acute illness to after the other labs that were all horrific. We learned Ryan had two small kidneys and one was, uh, two standard deviations smaller than the other. And ultimately learned after a couple eye surgeries for strabismus, which is muscle correction. We learned that he had, was not even using his right eye. So mm-hmm. his lit, and then remind, remember he had like all these respiratory infections, like one after the other. So when I was in there getting this acupuncture, I had immediate pain relief and my swelling went down. And this is like, I'm not saying you go to any random with needles. I'm saying she is five generations of her family are doing this. Wow. Um, but I felt immediate pain relief and the swelling went down and I used to sell, you know, drugs that provided pain relief or swelling. And I knew that that was unreal, like (laughs) those results. So it was just in there one day and learned that, um, I started asking her about Tom venting to her really about Ryan. And I said, my son just got all these labs back. He has Down syndrome and all of his vitamins are horrific. Like we're, you know, his doc, medical doctor has them on all these like vitamin B shots and different things it's just not getting into his cells and she's frustrated. I'm frustrated. You know, I've flown him all over the country. At one point he was on a daily suppository for over a year. Mm. Um, then at this point he was on like all this colon blow and I just was like venting never dreamed. I would bring my little six year old in there and, um, she just kept popping needles in my leg and she said, Oh yeah, he's not absorbing vitamins in his food. You can't, mm. you can't just raise the dose. He won't absorb it. And I kind of was like, well, do you have a way to do that? Or, I mean, I looked at her like she had 10 heads yeah. and she said, yeah, bring him in and we'll start with his stomach and go from there. And so my goal was like, maybe she can help with this constipation. Cause that's a big thorn in our side. I didn't have any hope or thought that she would solve any of those other issues I just mentioned. And I asked my medical doctor who also sees Ryan and I said, like MD, I said, I think I'm going to bring him to this doctor. What do you think? And she's the one who referred me to her. So she said, give it a shot because what we're doing is not working. And again, she's from India and she's trained here, uh, in the U.S., but ha- being able to zoom out and have global perspective that this is a big planet and mm-hmm. there are a lot of different ways of doing things and we don't right. have all the answers. Like, nope. And I think that's the other message for new families is really um, to just never stop uh, with that no limits mentality because once you realize that no one person has all the answers... Mm-hmm. It it gives you this boundless hope of like there's something out there and it's something is going to work. It's and, like widening your lens, right? It's like yeah. it's really easy to just get focused on these little tiny care plans, but right, open exactly. up your mind to other ideas. Yeah, yeah, and, and what works for like another po- patient population, like this therapy for kids with autism. Like, there's no reason we can't use it. And I'm not the first mom to use this therapy on my child with down syndrome uh right you know but i ryan had a pretty rigid flop and drop at transitions and didn't have language to say i don't feel well um so he was like asleep on the floor in the library and people were like oh i think it's just down syndrome and i'm like no he just like we need to behaviorally train him to a power through things when they're hard or he's tired and b say i don't feel well so i just felt like I needed yeah. some, some ninjas to help. Yeah. <laughs> with. Sounds like you got a few on your team. <laughs> Just keep looking for those 
people who are willing to look beyond the diagnosis and get in the trenches with you. So yeah. long story short with um, this Chinese medicine doctor, and again, I used to roll my eyes at this stuff, my background. <laughs> I definitely was not open-minded to this kind of stuff. But at this point, I figured I had nothing to lose. Mm-hmm. And his doctor agreed. So I brought him in and within uh, a week or two, he started pooping every day on his own. Wow. So that alone was the, a huge quality of life improvement for everyone in our family. Right. Right. I mean, I, I, I couldn't express to you how huge that was that I was, you know, a lot of families, there's, told it's 2020 and a lot of families are told like your kid's going to be in a diaper for the rest of his life or Mm. don't even bother potty training him at age three or so he was behaviorally potty trained but again the gi issues and stuff were kind of impeding the um you know it was a mess so then all these other uh things started improving like a ripple effect So Mm. we have all these therapists, these specialists that follow him, right? And his therapist had behaviorally trained him to hold the book at the proper distance. And she was monitoring his eyes and she was like, you need to get his eyes checked again. And I was like, I just went, like, we just went to the eye surgeon. Mm -hmm. So I went in there in my crutches and my boot with three kids and (laughs) he's, you know, they did all the measurements and everything. And he stopped and looked at me and he goes, He's a world-renowned eye surgeon. He said, what are you doing for Ryan's constipation? I said, oh, you're not going to believe this. Crutches, boot, broken foot, Chinese medicine, PhD. And he said, "Uh, Ryan's farsightedness just improved by a third. Wow. And that was uh, June of 2018. And I think he had been in the eye doctor in March or April. I can't remember. Oh, my gosh. Um. And so I said, so do you think I'm crazy? And he said, no, keep doing that. Like whatever you're doing. So then the next checkup again, they were like, what are you doing? It had gone from his vision had gone from 2070 to 2030. Oh my gosh. So, and then mind you, he had these kidneys that were way too small. His liver function was horrific. All his labs were horrific. So we had gotten this, these lab draws um, we did them routinely for his thyroid. He had low thyro- hypothyroidism. And also we were always monitoring the blood counts with the CBC and stuff. So in five weeks after we started going to her, his labs were all in normal range. I mean, it, it just shows you like literally everything is connected. You yeah. know, treatment for GI can affect this, can affect, I mean, it's just, it's, so, it's, Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he finally started absorbing vitamins in his food. And so when we got that first set of labs back, his MD, um, who's incredible, by the way, this is another huge resource and people do fly all over the country to see her. These It's Palm Health in St. Louis and um, they're functional medicine doctors. And she said, with tears in her eyes, she looked at me and said, Maura, I don't think you understand how much stuff he was on just to stay out of the ICU. Wow. And so his labs went from scary, horrific, every single one, barely hanging on. We're just trying to keep him out of the hospital to, um, I'm not just talking sick. I'm talking like rash sick. Like, is this, Yeah. we're going to the ICU. And, um, she was like, this is incredible. So his vitamin B, he had been on like B shots, this, that nothing was getting into his cells. And all of a sudden on this lab, it was through the roof, meaning he didn't need those supplements anymore. So we just, you know, slowly and safely took him off. So then he's all of a sudden on nothing. Yeah. He is pooping every day on his own, which that alone was like a huge life improvement so his labs are all of a sudden in normal range and then his thyroid dose he was on a thyroid pill every day for like a person like four times his size i mean it was Mm. very high dose and it came down it has come down a few times which never happens 
also vision in kids with Down syndrome. When he that eye doctor started telling me about his eyes improving, I mean, I expected him to say they were worse. I mean, kids get cataract surgeries at like age eight mm-hmm. with Down syndrome. I mean, vision really never improves. Um, yeah, I don't want to say never, but it's not common. And so all these things started improving, and then his kidneys are now the same size and growing normally for his size and wow. age and weight. Wow. So that was like mind blowing to the urologist and all of his doctors really. Uh, it just makes and, me wish that we had that kind of medicine in every single children's hospital and hospital. I like know. if they could just work together, I know it <laughs> doesn't have to Believe be me. so different. I know. I know. And then oh. apparently, so that's like the other thing I'm always saying to her. I'm like, wait, hold on. Why are you not on CNN? Are they yeah, racist? Yeah. <laughs> like, what do they do? What? Why, right. do I, why don't people know about this? Like, like what yeah. is happening? And she was like, well, you know, who pays for all the research? <laughs> so, I know. And it's then, true. Um, again, when you zoom out and realize mm-hmm. people are doing things differently and my, believe me, I lived in France for a year in college and worked at the European parliament studying and studied political science. And I was the arrogant study abroad kid who was like rolling my eyes at a lot of the things they were doing. Why don't they have chemicals in their food? And why don't they, yeah. why don't they sell yeah. deodorant? And you know, turns out they were a little bit ahead of us. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> now, and then we later learned he was not using his right eye, had zero depth perception. And so again, you're in PE class and or in right. general in the world, people think like these behaviors or these inability to, you know, really... Um, like motor control or hand-eye coordination, all this stuff is just Down syndrome, quote. Um, But really, it's like, well, what if we get the brain and the body to connect Mm -hmm. and things are all moving in the right direction? So now he has binocular vision, his depth perception is at age level. And so literally every category, and then he has not been sick in two years. He did not get influenza A the last two winters when it went around his class and he did not get the stomach flu the last two winters when it around went around the class Mm. and my husband travels like I said a ton and he's been in a between January and March of this year he was in probably 15 cities with COVID Mm. all over the world (laughs) and so he did not you know he did get some coughs and stuff like that but he didn't you know he's he's healthy I mean, he's very healthy. Now, we're in a pandemic, and we can't jinx it, so we're staying (laughs) home and not going anywhere. Absolutely, yeah. Which is not, you know, but I'd rather do that than be in the ICU. What has Ryan taught you about life and happiness that you didn't know before he came into your life? Um, (laughs) Why is that the throw in the tear trigger? Um, I know. So... Ryan really, truly, um, like I said, he's achieved, it's not that he's achieved much cause it's more about he has overcome so much and he proves every day that not just hard work. Cause I think the first three years or five years I've thought it was just hard work that was going to turn things around or help him but really um hard work and um just being open to new things has really proven that the no limits mentality can be applied to anything whether it's a typical kid who's dealing with a reading issue or a behavioral issue or, you know, trust me, my other two kids are, everybody's got things going on. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, or if it's a health issue, like Ryan has taught us really, um, that if you just keep 
playing an active role in finding the right resources, they're out there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's isolating certainly to feel like you're reinventing the wheel. Um, and like you're pushing, you know, sometimes you're in these meetings feeling like you're negotiating with North Korea, (laughs) feeling, you know, (laughs) talking about like, no, he can do more, you know, but, um, but if you just think outside the box, um, Ryan proves every day that anything is possible. And he, I mean, my husband and I, you know, of course we're proud of our other two typical kids, but like they have most things come easy to them, whether it's sports or reading or this and that, like any skill or behavior or health issue can be worked on and improved but when we see ryan achieve something we know particularly in the first six years when his health was so rough and it was a huge barrier to his success um i mean there were a lot of tears when he would just like sit up by himself or yeah yeah stand up by himself or start walking or talking or and now like this whole thing that went viral on the internet with him skipping um that was really again a back to the drawing board moment of um me going to dr zhang and saying okay he's been working on skipping and these preschool skills like we kind of just forgot about him for a while because he just wasn't getting them and was plateauing but he's got to get them because it'll help with shoe tying and ball skills and reading and writing and all these things, the left, right brain stuff. Um, And so she started focusing on those gross motor coordination and motor planning skills. I just knew like we could just make these leaps and rounds like much quicker. And he literally went from like plateauing and skipping and jumping jacks and all these skills. And again, who cares if he ever gets them? Sure. But it's just, he pretty much immediately yeah. got them after like five or six, tre- wow. five or six treatments. So the one other ex- kind of exciting thing is he did participate in a NIH study last summer and they did an MRI on his brain and the world renowned pediatric neuroradiologist called me and spent like 40 minutes on the phone and wrote up a report and said, I could not tell when we're looking at Ryan's brain that he has Down syndrome. Wow. So typically you'd see like smaller gray matter, atrophy, you know, all these kind of things. And, um, he said, I, he said, I can typically tell when looking at a child's MRI, if they have a developmental delay and then go confirm later in the chart. And he said, I could not tell when looking at Ryan's oh brain. Gosh. So, um, it just goes to show that, um, the brain is a muscle yeah. <laughs> and if you use it and then, you know, Dr. Zhang put it, does put in a lot of needles in his brain because I was like, by the way, he has, um, the APO gene and kids with Down syndrome are more like, like a hundred percent will have signs of Alzheimer's on their brain by age 40. So again, the list is very long yeah. <laughs> of issues. And, um, her research in China was on, um, silencing the Alzheimer's gene or maybe a uh, vascular dementia. But point is, yeah, whatever she's doing, I can't really explain it in Western medicine terms, but doctor the neuroradiologist was like i mean from everything you're telling me with his kidneys and brain and everything it's like producing blood flow to the organs sure. so that applies to all humans yeah so. <laughs> it's the connectedness of it all my favorite part right. um is you mentioned the little video of um him skipping and your husband skipping alongside each other And I have to say my favorite part is at the end when he looks at your husband and says, I'm so proud of you, dad, because what that does is it, it's showing the love that you guys give to him so easily just pours through him to someone else too. You know, it's like he has just done this amazing task and this amazing thing. And his immediate reaction is to give love 
right? So that, that just must be what he feels all of the time from you and your husband. So I think that's a pretty awesome thing. Well, thank you. I mean, he certainly feels it from his siblings because he wouldn't be where he is without them either. They're yeah. tough on him and they have high expectations. And um, I think I have one video on my old, on my Instagram of our older son. He plays hockey and he's teaching him to roller skate in the driveway. Yeah. And I just came outside and he's yelling at him. And, you know, he's teaching him crossovers with his skates, which is yeah. like a complicated sure. thing like hockey <laughs> yeah. thing I cannot do it yeah. and um, and then he's like put his hockey stick on the ground and he said alright Ryan now we're going to do jump crossovers and Ryan's wearing these like old school Fisher Price yes, yeah. you know skates from like the 80s or whatever and he said we're going to do jump crossovers and I'm like whoa 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 JP what are you doing did you learn jump crossovers the same day you learned crossover yeah and I'm thinking like how many lessons did it take you like years <laughs> to do, yeah. you know yeah what are you doing and he's like no mom he's doing amazing he can do it I and it that. just that to me is like the epitome of you know what I wish the whole world would do with kids right? with disabilities it's yeah. just give him a chance like what who am I to say Ryan can't learn these jump crossovers he's JP's like mom he's doing it anything is possible and the higher the bar you set they will reach it yes it's going to take some thinking outside the box but once you kind of zoom out and realize there's a lot of people out there with incredible ideas and there's the there are no limits on what they can do Thank you so much, Tamora, for sharing your story and for sharing Ryan's journey and how the no limits mentality truly helped your family and turn Ryan's health around. If you'd like to follow along with Mora, you can do so on Instagram at Mora, and that's Seneff, S-E-N-N-E-F-F. And make sure you're tuned in and subscribe to Child Life on Call for next week's podcast. Have a great week. Bye.